Now we turn to chapter 19, uh, which is in your book is entitled Building the Earth's Surface. And the idea here is that the earth uh, surface of the earth is involved in plate tectonic processes that result in ongoing buildup of the surface. And these are certain things that we see taking place today. Now, interpreting this is very important. Uniformitarianism is the idea that the present is the key to the past. Uh, the other way is to look at catastrophism, right? In other words, we had some really dramatic changes that take place, and we see that take, and, they, and that uh, uh, takes place even today. Volcanoes, earthquakes, meteor impacts, all of them have very dramatic ones, and they can take place inside of a day, okay? Uniformitarianism tries to make it sound like there are uh, millions of eons that take, uh, that are, uh, uh, that take place. And it's is, this is replaced, this uh, type of, this right here is more consistent with the uh, biblical definition of the age of the earth. This one right here, the present is the key to the past, it means that things are happening at a very slow rate and have been happening at that time all the time. And that's why we have to go back many, many years and that, that's why we can eliminate the idea of a creator. Uh, we have seen that volcanoes, earthquakes, and meteor impacts can have a very dramatic, very real effect of a mountain emerging from the ocean in a single day, in a single day. And it's been caught on video sh showing that that happens. Okay. But uh, and, and the strange thing about this is that there have actually been experiments that uh, uh, we have a, a earth core that is molten and that is slowly cooling down. If you were to say that that has been occurring at the same exact rate all the time, because it's, it's uh, away from these sort of catastrophic events, what you would find out, according to the calculations, is that the earth is between 8,000 and 10,000 years old, and that's it. That's it. If you look at the cooling of the core of the earth, okay, that is what it's been calculated out to be, if that is occurring at exactly the same rate. So there is this divergence in terms of explanations for how this happens. What we know is that certain things do take place today, both these as well as things can also happen to a slow extent as well. So uh, diastrophism is the process of deformation of change that changes the Earth's surface. Diastrophism, diastrophism, right? Produces such structures as plateaus, mountains, folds in the crust. It's related to volcanism, the movement of magma, and earthquakes. It's the basic working theory for plate tectonics for this to take place. And it's again stress and strain. As we saw at those different boundaries, they're either pulled apart or deformed, or they're shifted, they're pushed against each other along the strain line. There's elastic strain, and they return to uh, original shape. There's plastic strain, it's molded or bent, this does not return to original shape, or the fracture strain, the rock cracks or breaks. Here you have compressive stress, placed moving together, the tensional stress, they're moving apart, and the shear stress are the most sliding past each other. So you have three stress forces, and associated with them is the strain. Stress deformation. This is something that, that occurs with any material. You, you think of a metal or, or as something very, very strong. But essentially what happens is if you push, pull on it, what happens is the material itself is going to deform slightly depending upon what, if it uh, has a high elastic limit or a low elastic limit. This right here would be something that's rather rather brittle. Okay, when it, you, you pull it just so far and that's it. it it's just gone. Uh, this right here is more ductile. This is a, a, a metal. You can extrude out aluminum. You can extrude out uh, steel, things like that. You can actually pull them up quite a bit and undergo quite a bit of stress until they get to a point where 
all of a sudden they start stretching and then and then rupturing. So it's possible responses are to stress or no change, elastic change with recovery, plastic change with no recovery, okay, uh, breaking from pressure. So this can happen with metals and also with rocks, it can happen as well. And depending upon the nature of the rock, the temperature of the rock, how fast you apply that stretch, or whether it's under pressure, you know, it's uh, beneath the whole lot, beneath the mountain, determines how this whole thing plays out. So sedimentary rock is originate from flat sedimentary deposits. Layers are usually horizontal. Bends in them occur when the, the bedrock shifts, the result of stress in those uh, areas, right? Widespread, widespread horizontal stress can produce domes and basins. Anticline is arc-shaped structure. Syncline is a trough-shaped structure. So this is an anticline. This is a syncline. Folds, and you can see looking along here, yes, there's quite You've got a, a couple of different varieties there, don't you? So an arch-shaped structure is an anticline. Syncline is a trough-shaped structure. So you've got an arch shape here. You've got a trough shaped here. So it's a, a bent result in stress-produced plastic strains. Wide-produced stress can produce domes and basins. And you can see it along the, the lines here as well, right? A fault is produced by relative movement on the opposite side of the crack, on the opposite side, okay? So a foot wall is the mass of rock below the fault, and a hanging wall is the mass of rock above the fault. And the fault plane is the surface between the foot wall and the hanging wall. So this right here would be the fault plane. This up here would be the, oops, sorry, your hanging rock up here, your foot fall wall would be down here, right? For this fault right here. Normal fault is a hanging wall is moved down relative to the foot wall. And this is a, these are called a graben, okay? Which is a block surrounded by normal faults. And this drops down here. A horst, and it's, it's just think of it as hoist, right? It's up above the other two. So Graben is down below, Horst is up above. You can tell that the Germans were the one who named these things. Okay, a reverse fault is the hanging wall moves upward relative to the foot wall. Thrust fault is the reverse fall has a low fault angle plane. Okay, so two different types of them. The fault provides information on the stresses produced by the formation. Okay. Earthquakes, there's a quaking or shaking or vibrating upheaval of the ground, results from sudden release of energy from stress on the rocks. Oops. And the vibrations are the seismic waves, and we talked about the three different types earlier. Most occur along the fault planes, with one side is displaced with respect to the other. Okay, so this might have been a straight line fence. Now this is uh, down this way, and this is on this plane. When this right here shifts. Okay, why did it? Uh, causes are the elastic rebound theory, and these are just theories. Two plates pressed together tightly, friction produces, restricts motion, stress builds up until the friction of rock ruptures, stress rock snaps suddenly into a new position. And you can locate the epicenter. Epicenter is always uh, it, it, well, epicenter is, the, uh, is on the surface below where the focus is. The focus is the actual origin of the seismic wave. This right here is the location of the Earth's surface directly above it. The seismograph is the instrument used to detect and measure earthquakes. And there's three different types, the P wave, S wave, and surface wave that we talked about in the prior chapter. P waves travel faster than S waves, yes. And so, and so you have here, this is the first one, the P wave, then comes the S wave, and then the surface wave. Now, this S wave does not mean, this is not the aftershock. The aftershock is something that happens differently, okay? But there is a time lag between these. 
P waves travel faster, difference in arrival correlates to the distance from the earthquake. So they can use that to tell how far away it is. Triangulation of several different points, in terms of how far it took to reach there, allows you to pinpoint where the epicenter is. And remember the focus is the point down below that uh, epicenter where it actually occurred. Uh, now, classification. It's based upon the depth of focus. A shallow focus earthquake is down to 70 kilometers deep. Okay, that's shallow. 85% of all earthquakes are like that. Intermediate is 70 to 30 to 300 kilometers deep. This is the upper part of the mantle. And this is the lower part of the mantle, is the deep focus ones. About 3% of all the earthquakes. These are the worst of all. Okay. Measuring earthquake strength is another way. Okay. So uh, you can have earthquake strength one, it's not felt at all, to earthquake of, of 12 right here. Total destruction with visible ground waves. Okay. And this talks about the safety that you can take during these. And we have this as part of our safety program in every lab uh, because we do have uh, uh, possibilities of earthquakes here in uh, Missouri. The Richter scale, not, not as often or as frequent or, or as damaging uh, as they have in California, but we still have them. Uh, they're based on the Richter scale, which is swings of the seismographic recording, and they're a logarithmic scale. So a three is not felt. Nine is the largest measured so far. And this gear right here gives you the, uh, the magnitude of them in terms of the Richter scale, right? Uh, measuring earthquake strength, some of the early uh, recent ones. This is the magnitude. This is the place where they happen. Uh, and this is the time. This happened in, two, in, uh, in uh, 2011. 2010, 2010, 2010, 2011. Okay. And you'll see all of these are on the on this NASDAQ plate uh, or the Pacific plate with these with these different ones. And the safety, this is what I uh, uh, have in the earlier slide. Tsunamis are the ocean waves created by the earthquakes. Can be the largest of ocean waves. They have sp speeds reaching up to 700 kilometers per hour. Most of the damage that, uh, uh, in the, in the, the Fujisuma or Fuji, whatever it was, uh, in, uh, in, in Japan was due to the tsunami, not to the earthquake itself. The wavelengths can be 200 kilometers long, can be 0.5 meters in the deep ocean and eight meters in shallow water. As they reach the, as they come closer and closer to shore, they go higher and higher. Uh, origins of mountains, elevated parts of the Earth's crust rising abruptly from surrounding surface. They can, the three basic ocean, uh, three basic origins, ones we talked about, folding, faulting of volcanic activity. Folded and faulted, like the Appalachian Mountains revealed by weathering and erosion. And you can see how it is, the erosion, all of that. And this is a photograph of the Virginia, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky border. Folded and faulted mountains rise sharply along steeply inclined fault plains. And the weathering here has very sharp edges. Volcanic mountains are hill or mountain formed by extrusion of lava, rock fragments from magma below. And these have vent, crater, and lava flow cause the, these different ones. And then the types of volcanoes are a shield constructed of solidified lava flows, broad, uh, gentle slopes, a cylindrical cone constructed of rock fragments, steep, smaller shield, composite, alternate layers of cylinder, uh, cinders, ash, and lava with volcanic mo uh, mud. And other features, uh, most magna remains underground, cooled and solidifies to form intrusion rocks. The batholith is a large amounts of mag uh, crystallized magma, stock, small protrusions of the batholith, and these are, uh, they have these different names according to the different ones here. An overall picture is something like this, and I think that's going to be the end of that chapter.